Hi, I'm here with Robert Freeland, core designer for Icarus Interstellar. You, I mean, you're a businessman. You're like one of the few people that's on this team that has a, you know, a huge business background. How do you see this project being funded? Well, that's actually a rather difficult question. Um, the, it seems to me that you have to have some sort of partnership between um, government entities and private enterprise in order uh -huh. to do this. Um, you know, you're looking at a project that's going to go on for a hundred years, potentially, and... <laughs> it's uh, a very long project. <laughs> it's a long project, and yet you're also talking about a tremendous amount of money. Mm -hmm. And so, it seems to me that you need the government uh, component in order to get the dollar amounts that we need, and yet you need the private enterprise component in order to keep it alive that long. Um, because, you know, government funding is always uh, susceptible to potential cancellations and so uh -huh. forth, and you don't want the whole project canceled 75 years in. Um, that would just be <laughs> that would disaster. be terrible. Yeah. And um, you know, how did you get involved in this project? You know, you, you come from such a different background from everyone else that we've seen so far on this team. Well, my undergraduate degree was in physics, and I went promptly into the computer field. But I had kind of sparked this idea just out of college that you could build a, a software model of the universe, and so I got started on this uh, right out of college um, and quickly realized you were really thinking ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, it bit off way more than I could chew. I, uh, I quickly uh, backed that down to just doing the Milky Way galaxy, which in itself is a huge project. Yeah. But um, I uh, managed to get something running in uh, under DOS uh, using C++ that was, you know, a rough model of the galaxy that you could move around in. Um, but then I got a real job and I uh, had to go take a couple years off to do that. And when I came back, uh, you know, the technology had all changed. And so I scrapped mm -hmm. everything I'd done before and started on it again. And um, similar sort of thing happened then. I made a little more progress and then I got another job and had to go do that. And when I came back, everything had changed again. So I scrapped all that. And the uh, ESA uh, project had just come back with the Hipparcos data, which gave us distances to all of the stars. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that was, well, I mean, it's like, I say all the stars. It was like all the ones that we can see with the naked eye from Earth. Um, so I took that data and uh, created a third version of this whole thing that uh, was, you know, just the uh, the stars that you could see with the naked eye, and so it was most of the stuff that was close. And um, then I discovered that uh, there was someone else who had, uh, had a similar sort of concept and come up with it. Uh, you may have heard of Celestia, which is a software program that you can download from the internet uh -huh. um, that has a database that was also built on Hipparcos that has all of this stuff, and you can fly around in it, though, in spaceships that aren't exactly accurate. And so this was kind of the point I was at. When so you really I, wanted something accurate. I wanted it to be accurate, yeah. I, I wanted a simulation. Um, and at times, I had actually thought of this in, in gaming terms, you know, yeah. like maybe this would be a game. But I, I think it would not make a very exciting game for most people because you know, there's a lot of waiting in between doing things in uh, interstellar travel. There's just humongous distances. And um, even if you start to postulate speeds close to the speed of light, um, and you take into account the relativistic time dilation effects and so forth that would uh, impact the crew, it's still a lot of waiting, and it just doesn't make a very exciting game. But I was interested in doing it as a simulation to just see what it would be like. And, um, and then so coming onto this team was really like kind of the next step for you? Yeah, it was, um, you know, I stumbled across the Icarus uh, project, and I said, this looks right down my alley. You yeah. know, so I sent an email, and uh, Richard responded, and uh, I got And all is history from yeah. there, right? <laughs> um, so you live in Florida, you know, you're not far from where Saturn V uh, to the moon and all those space shuttles launched. Um, does this actually influence how you feel about all this? Uh, somewhat. I mean, I had the opportunity uh, for the second to last shuttle launch to get out to Cape Canaveral or uh, more appropriately Merritt Island and uh -huh. see the launch from there. Uh, and so that was that was a really good experience. And I wouldn't have been able to do that, I think, if I'd lived anywhere else. Yeah. So that's inspiring. Yet at the same time, you know, I've only been in Florida 10 years. So, you know. Only 10 years. <laughs> so it's not like. You're it. practically native. Uh, yeah. By Florida standards, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. And what do you see as the biggest technical issue um, going forward with Project Icarus? The biggest? Oh, wow. Oh, the are, biggest. <laughs> the biggest. There are so many technical issues that it's hard to even know where to start. Um, the one that I've t focused on most, I think, and this is because I want to actually see this thing launch before I die. Yes. And uh, to do that... As I think we all kind of do, yeah? Yeah. Um, and there are a couple just showstoppers that we have to get past in order for that to happen. And the one that I've focused on recently and that I'm presenting on tomorrow uh, relates to the fuel choice uh -huh. for the fusion reaction. 
the Daedalus team chose to use deuterium and helium-3 because it doesn't produce any neutrons. But the problem is we can't get helium-3 here on Earth. Um, we think we can mine some of it from the lunar regolith, but it's very uh, scarce there, and so it would, we'd have to process mountains of the moon to do it. Um, the Daedalus team actually presupposed that we were going to mine this off of the atmosphere of Jupiter, but again, you know, you're talking about a tremendous operation just to get the fuel, and then you've got to build the ship. So Makes sense. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things I'm trying to figure out is, is there a way that we can use fuel that we actually have mm -hmm. and uh, still get around this neutron problem? So, I, you know, I'm going to say maybe that's the biggest problem right now, though actually yeah. getting the fusion reaction to work is also a big problem. I see and uh, then we have big communications problems, too. So. So there's a few like kind of issues that you guys need to work through before this can yep. be a more viable thing. Yep. Um, do you think that this is going to happen in our lifetime? I would like to hope so, uh -huh. but there are some things that have to happen soon. Um, one of them is to get uh, you know net output from a fusion reaction. Uh, right now, we're still pursuing that both at the uh, NIF and IDER facility over mm -hmm. in Europe. And uh, until that happens, you know, this whole fantasy of using fusion to power a spaceship is still way off. I think once we turn that corner, though, you know, then you can start looking at miniaturization and improvement in the uh, efficiency of the operation. And, you know, then we're getting closer. Yeah. So. I agree with you on that. Well, thank you so much for taking all your time out today. I mean, this is a huge project. It's a big deal. And everyone's really excited about it. So congratulations on what you guys have done so far. All right. Thank you. Yeah.